Today, we're going to be talking about two different scholarship programs. One is through the National Science Foundation, NSF, which is the CyberCore program or Scholarship for Service. Um, while they brand it CyberCore, it is a civilian program. It is not associated with the military. It's not Peace Corps. It's nothing like that. Um, it is a program where they are trying to get more people who have cybersecurity expertise working for the federal government, trying to protect our, our nation. The second program we're going to be talking about is the DOD Cyber Scholarship Program, or CISP. And that's specifically going to be for Department of Defense. They actually choose which agency that you're going to work with as part of the program. There are a number of similarities between these two programs. Both of them offer uh, tuition coverage, stipends. Both of them also use a one-for-one -one model where you agree to paid employment for each year in which you receive the scholarship. But there are gonna be some differences and we'll go through that as part of the presentation. So the first thing is why you might be interested in this. So if you think it would be interesting to be able to, to help protect the country against cyber attacks or work on projects that you can't do in the private sector, that might be one reason to be involved in, in these two programs. There's a lot of work on being able to build tools and defending infrastructure from attacks. And frankly, these scholarship programs um, put students in the company of other cybersecurity experts in the government other scholarship students who are some of the best in the country at being able to do cybersecurity. So if that is uh, the kind of group of people that you would like to work with, this might be a good opportunity for you. So a high level overview of the programs. So both scholarships are gonna be available to US citizens and permanent residents that are pursuing cybersecurity at WPI. So, while they say that permanent residents are eligible for it, you do need to be able to get a security clearance with the Department of Defense for the DOD CISP program. And for many of the programs through the NSF scholarship, you'll also need to be able to get a security clearance. Um, my understanding is that it's difficult to do so as a permanent resident that's not a US citizen, but this is specifically the language that Congress has given us. So we all get to try to navigate it uh, as best we can. So for each year of the scholarship program, um, you will essentially receive stipend and tuition support. The way that you pay for that is by serving the government upon graduation in a paid employment role. So this is not something where you are essentially getting a stipend and, and tuition and then you donate your time or work for free for the government upon graduation. You are a paid employee. Um, the fact that you were in the SFS program or just you know, applied for the position without being part of the SFS, it's the same job. So it's, it's not like you're treated any differently for having been um, uh, by having an SFS obligation or anything like that. Um, your employers wanna keep you. It's a really sweet deal for them. It's a really sweet deal for the students who are selected for it. Some students have asked if there are non-defense organizations that they could work for as part of the SFS program. The answer is yes. I'll give you a list of federal agencies that um, do not have intelligence or defense missions. Um, there are some that are law enforcement. There are some that are not law enforcement or defense or intelligence. So we'll talk about those different options. For the DOD CISP program, um, it is the Department of Defense that you'd be working with. So um, that is something that you would wanna make sure is a good match for, for your career goals. With both of these programs, you are expected to do paid internships with the government over the summers while you're still in the scholarship phase. So for example, if you started this program as a junior and plan to do it for your junior, senior, and a graduate year to, do, to earn a master's degree, you would be expected to do internships twice between those three years. Um, after finishing your third year, you would then go on to paid employment um, and begin working down the, the time on your uh, service obligation. So common to both scholarships. Again, US citizen, permanent resident maybe for an SFS program, but it's basically US citizens. Um, you need to be a full-time student. You need to be studying cybersecurity at WPI. You need to be clearance eligible, which means that you have to not have obstacles that would get in your way of a security clearance. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Um, 
we can start offering the scholarship for students in their junior years. We can cover graduate students, uh, whether they're doing a master's degree or PhD. We can cover people in their junior and senior years of undergrad as well. Um, again, the paid employment um, for internships during the scholarship phase. With the DOD program, your internship destination is going to be selected for you as part of being selected for the DOD program. They pick which agency you'll be working for and which agency you'll be doing your, your internships for. And it's, it's pretty much gonna be the same place for both of them. When you get an offer from this ISP program, you get to know which agency selected you for it and you can choose whether or not to, to accept that offer. Both programs are gonna cover your tuition, fees, and books. Um, they have a stipend. The, the two programs have slightly different stipends. One's gonna be 25K for undergrads, the other's 27. For graduate students, it's 32 to 34K. Um, and again, it's this one-for-one -one basis. Each year that you're receiving the scholarship and these benefits, you're agreeing to work for the government for a year. So for the SFS program, it is capped at three years of support for each student. So again, junior, senior, graduate year, three years. Um, if you're just doing a master's degree and it only takes two, that's fine. If you're doing a PhD, which often takes five years, it can support at max three of those five years. The SISP program is a little bit different in that it can support up to five years of support. Um, with the SISP program, again, an agency selects you for the program as part of the admissions process. With the SFS program, you would be doing your own job search. So we essentially help people figure out how to find the federal agencies that are eligible. We talk a little bit about resumes, interviewing processes, the whole work so that students are successful with their applications. With the SFS program, you don't submit a renewal application. Essentially, we reevaluate you again each year and make sure that things are still going well with your academic record. If all checks out and we have the funds for it, we renew people automatically. The SISP program is run directly by the DOD. We submit materials to them, the student submits materials to them for a renewal process. Those seem to happen pretty regularly, but there is indeed a, another evaluation cycle with them. There are different deadlines for them. So for the DOD program, the deadline is uh, February 1st. For SFS, we've got until February 28th. With the SFS program, WPI administers the grant. So the review panel is WPI faculty and staff that will be evaluating students for it. With the SISP program, we provide a recommendation to the Department of Defense. Department of Defense evaluates each of the students. So hopefully bouncing back and forth, you can see that the, the programs have a lot of similarities. There are some differences associated with them. If you're interested in both programs, you can indeed apply for both. If you are selected for the DOD SISP program, um, you will essentially agree to automatically withdraw your application to the SFS program. The same faculty and staff are involved in the two programs. We'll know that you got the, the SISP program. We'll basically say, hey, it looks like you got SISP. You can only have one. Are you planning to do SISP? Good, all right. We'll give the, your, your potential SFS slot to somebody else. So we handle that pretty seamlessly. You, there's no problem in applying for both. Know that SISP is, is taken as a priority over the SFS program. Okay, uh, so the benefits, I've talked a little bit about this already, but again, full tuition coverage, nice stipend, covers textbook, textbooks. Um, the SFS program also covers uh, travel and professional development. There's this annual job fair, and you can kind of see a little picture of, of one of these fairs from, I think, many years ago. Um, but uh, there's this uh, fair that happens usually January each year where when it's not a pandemic, People gather in person um, and you, you interview with people and you basically get this one-stop shopping experience where you can vid visit a bunch of federal agencies at once. So it's a pretty good experience. Um, it's actually required for the SFS program. During the pandemic years, we've been doing this virtually. Um, not as fun. Uh, and I will say that um, students kind of feel like it's a little wonky in comparison, but still it's an opportunity to get connected with federal agencies talk to them about what they're doing. Um, 
get, get yourself in front of them. With both of these programs, you're essentially being selected out of a, a pool of applicants. They're both very competitive awards. And so when people see this on your resume, they're going, great, I already know that this person's pre-vetted. This person's gonna be able to do well in cybersecurity. And that itself can be a foot in the door. With the DOD program, you might not care as much because, well, DOD has already selected you for an employer, so you don't even have to do the job search. For the SFS program, you basically have a new hiring authority. So that's a fun thing with the federal government. Are there different designations in which they can hire people? A hiring authority allows people to sometimes do non-competitive hiring because you are an SFS student, which can expedite the hiring process, which Hiring managers love for the process to be expedited. And so you can imagine that might affect their preferences. So um, it's a, a pretty nice uh, in there. The service component is uh, a, a year for each year that you got the scholarship. Uh, it goes down to half years. So if you are funded, for example, for two and a half years to, to finish your degree, you would have two and a half years that they would want you to uh, serve uh, the government. Um, it doesn't, they don't understand undergraduate terms. I think we're all still having trouble understanding undergraduate terms. The federal government doesn't get it. So half years is the, the shortest granularity that they work with. Um, so again, with CISP, you've got an agency that picked you, that's where you'll go. For SFS, you do your own job search, and that can be at federal agencies, state or local governments, or FFRDCs, according to the national guidelines. I'm going to get back to that here in a second, though. Um, the WPI specific SFS program is doing things a little bit differently, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Wherever you go to work, you must be working in a security related role. So you could work for the federal agency, and it's not at all related to cybersecurity, doesn't count. It actually has to be using your cyber, cybersecurity background. Who determines if it's using cybersecurity? Your hiring manager. They would designate that, yes, indeed, this person is working on cybersecurity as part of this job. Government contractors that are not labs or FFRDCs are not eligible. So you may have heard of organizations like BAE, Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon. None of those will work. They are private sector companies. They are not eligible for the SFS program. They are not going to be sponsoring agencies associated with DOD. While you are doing your service phase, you are being paid a competitive wage during that time. So this isn't something where you're like agreeing to be an indentured servant or something like that. You are going to be treated like a federal employee that hiring managers were lucky to get. So they're there to keep you happy. They want you to have a good experience. They want you to continue working there after your service obligation is over. And frankly, after they hire you, they might forget that you have a service obligation altogether. OPM will make sure and we'll check in with you on that, but your hiring managers are there to keep you happy because they know that you're free agents. So with the SFS program, if you don't like the person that you're, you're, you're working with, you wanna switch organizations, pick another one, switch to it, no big deal. As long as it's an eligible entity, you can switch to them and there, there's not a problem associated with it. With the DOD CISP program, you are expected to work at the particular agency that is, is funding you. So I'm not sure what the switching options are uh, with that program. I suspect that there, there aren't a lot of them. So you, you may need to, to stick with your, your hiring employer there. So again, the employers need you, they want you. The goal is to make sure that you are a happy camper there and that they get to keep you after your service obligation. So they're gonna treat you well. Other requirements to keep in mind. So students are gonna to have to do the summer internships. You cannot have other employment while you are in the scholarship phase. So you can't be a, a teaching assistant while having the scholarship program. You can't work uh, fast food or something like that. The expectation is that because you're receiving the stipend and the tuition coverage, you do not have any other employment at WPI or externally. There's a little bit of wiggle room where if you're doing something that is cybersecurity related and it's a job of less than 10 hours a week, 
maybe there's an opportunity that we can get that approved. But in general, you should be thinking if you get the scholarship, you aren't going to be doing outside employment. You do need to be able to get um, a security clearance um, for DOD. That's a requirement for the NSF program. Um, it's strongly recommended. Um, and so we'll ask about that as part of it. Attending the job fair if you're SFS. And whether you're SFS or DOD, you do need to be uh, attending these job uh, uh, seminars that we have. So we bring in people from the different SFS eligible employers to come visit campus. Again, right now it's virtually, before it was in person. People are going to be visiting and telling you a little bit about what their organization does so that you can decide if that's something that you might be interested in applying to. So we require that of people that are doing the SFS program. We find it's actually beneficial for people in the DOD program as well, so that they can know how different parts of the federal government operate and fit together. So it's generally a good experience. Um, it is expected that people will do them. For the, the last requirement, as part of administering the SFS program and the DOD program, WPI has some responsibilities for understanding what our students are up to, keeping up with their academics, making sure that things are going well. Um, we're here to help you. And we are also needing to ask you questions sometimes when the government says, we need a report that tells us which students are doing this kind of activity. We would expect that you keep us in the loop on how all of that is going. So eligible employers for the SFS program are going to be pretty much any federal agency. And you might be thinking there are some agencies that are going to hire more people than others, and that is totally true. So one of the biggest employers out of the SFS program is actually the, the National Security Agency. So NSA hires a lot of people. Um, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, they also hire a lot of people. They are not the only games in town. And in fact, um, while the FBI and Secret Service also hire SFS students, you can see agencies like the FCC or NIST or the FDA are all organizations that may have cybersecurity roles available, in which if you find one of those and want to work there, that's great. They're all federal agencies and, and that's a good experience. There are other employers that are eligible, but there's this rule that was created by Congress as part of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017. <sighs> yes. That's a really creative law name, right? But okay, so the, the NDAA basically said that as part of the SFS program, they wanted 80% of students or more going to federal agencies. They said that up to 20% nationally of SFS students could work in state government, local government, or FFRDCs. That 20% rule is incredibly difficult for organizations to actually adopt. At WPI, historically, um, we have gone well over 20% of people going to FFRDCs. In particular, um, some people may know of MITRE Corporation. It is an FFRDC. It's located less than 50 miles from the WPI campus, and they recruit regularly at WPI. It probably surprises nobody that a lot of SFS students ended up going to MITRE. This is true for all universities, not just WPI. This is what caused Congress to say, we need to put a cap on it. We need a 20% maximum, was because other federal agencies weren't getting their fair shot at students because MITRE hired everybody. Um, because of WPI's history with this and knowing that it is extremely difficult for us to be able to figure out which 20% of our SFS students should be able to go to FFRDCs or, or whatever. We have instead taken the approach of, you should ignore the existence of FFRDCs or state or local government. You should apply to federal agencies. So you must seek federal agency opportunities. If we end up in a dire situation where you are somehow unable to get a position at, an F at a federal agency, and you've been searching for a year after graduation and still can't find anything, we would then be willing to consider FFRDCs. That's how we're planning to use the 20% category is in, in case of emergency, it's available to us. But by basically pointing everybody to federal agencies, we're making sure that we have that 20% available in those circumstances. 
So that being said, I'm going to talk a little bit about some other organizations um, that would fall into that 20% category, knowing that you need to focus on the federal agencies instead. So for example, national laboratories. This one's tricky. Um, so we have asked the, the government multiple times about whether Department of Energy National Laboratories, think Los Alamos National Labs, Lawrence Livermore, Pacific Northwest National Labs, um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Fermilab, those kinds of institutions, are they part of the federal government, the Department of Energy, which is a federal agency, or are they an FFRDC? The answer has changed. So the most recent answer we have is that they are part of the Department of Energy. And thus, if you work at a national laboratory that is Department of Energy, they are counted as part of the federal agency. They count as 80%. We're all good. End of story. Now, what about Department of Defense National Laboratories? In particular, MIT Lincoln Lab is a DOD lab. Are they considered part of the federal government? No, they are not. And for whatever reason, there is a particular contracting relationship, but MIT Lincoln Lab is not considered a, a part of the federal agencies. So you can see how like this gets a little bit complicated and confusing. We're here to help you with all of this. So if you're targeting a particular organization, you wanna work at a particular place as part of the SFS program, let us know as part of your application and your interviews will help make sure that you're going to end up at a place that is compatible with what we're trying to do here. So national laboratories, newly in, previously uh, they were considered not eligible. Glad that they're back in. Uh, state and local government are still actually part of the 20% rule. So while working in a cybersecurity rule for the state of Massachusetts would be perfectly fine for the 20%, we do need you to prioritize federal agencies instead. Um, if you found a cybersecurity role with the city of Worcester, I hear they exist. Um, again, that would be a backup option if you were able to get a federal agency position. Um, so local options, I've already mentioned, MITRE, not gonna be an option. Um, that is going to be part of the 20% category. The same is true of MIT Lincoln Lab. Again, if you're unable to, to land a position with a federal agency and it's getting a little bit desperate at this point, we can talk about these options because they are part of the, the 20%. We just can't do it as a, a federal agency position. Okay, so different routes and programs that you could pursue as part of the scholarship phase of these two programs. So again, if you would like to do a PhD, the um, the SFS program can cover up to three years. So one model might be after being a PhD student for a couple years, you could finish your last three years under the SFS program. With the DOD program, they can cover up to five years, so they could do the entire period. Uh, Master of Science, both programs can cover both years. Bachelor, Master's combination programs are very popular with both the DOD and the, the SFS programs. So those begin in your junior or senior year, which means you can apply as a sophomore for it to start August of your junior year, for example. Um, we do do this by credit. So if the registrar is saying you are a junior and you've only been here a year, somehow you did all the AP credit that exists. I don't know, people are creative in how they do things. As long as the registrar considers you a junior, you're a junior according to the federal government. So. That, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Um, you can continue those scholarships into your graduate year if you're continuing to do it at WPI. If you switch to go to a different graduate school, um, say a master's degree at, at another institution, you would need to apply for their SFS program and get separately admitted to it. But again, SFS as a whole is only gonna be able to support you for three years total. That's probably not gonna work out right and it gets complicated. So if you're thinking about doing an option like that, really talk to us about it and, and we'll see. You could just do a bachelor's degree. So we're not gonna hold it against you if you're saying, I just wanna do a bachelor's degree here and I'm gonna do a master's degree somewhere else. We're not gonna say, oh, is our graduate degree not good enough for you and you 
you can't have SFS now or something like that. That's fine, but talk to us about it so that we can make sure that you get what you need out of it. And again, if you just want to do the bachelor's degree, you can do that for a couple of years. The key thing to know is that when you graduate, the government is going to pay you based on the, the amount of education that you have that affects your um, pay scale, essentially. And the pay scale between a bachelor's degree and a master's degree is a, su a substantial jump. So many people will say, if I'm getting one of these awards, might as well go for the master's degree because it will end up paying for it in the long run. So something to consider. Security clearances. So many employers are gonna require security clearance. DOD uniformly requires it. For the SFS program, there may be some places that don't require clearances, but many of them are going to need one because you're working in cybersecurity. Um, Different employers are going to have different criteria and vetting processes associated with them. So as you might imagine, uh, organizations that are related to law enforcement or intelligence capabilities are going to be particularly stringent for people applying for their security clearances. So for example, if you're applying for a position with the FBI that requires a security clearance, you're going to want to make sure that you haven't like violated the law, like at all. So they're gonna be particular uh, sticklers for that. Other agencies will say, okay, well, you know, some missteps may happen in applicants' careers. If it's been a long time and it wasn't that big of a deal to begin with, then, you know, they might still be eligible for security clearances. One of the biggest areas that affects college students nationwide, not specific to WPI, um, is the, the consumption of marijuana. While that is legal according to the state of Massachusetts, it is illegal according to the federal government. Accordingly, some people may uh, have pursued that route and are not eligible for security clearances with certain agencies. Again, FBI is going to be a particular stickler for that. Other agencies will say, it was a long time ago and you haven't done it since. We have an opportunity for forgiveness there. So it will vary by agency. If this is at any form of a concern for you, let us know. You can bring it up during the interview. If it's something where we're going, you're going to have a really tough time with this, we're going to let you know during the interview. And we don't want you going into a program where you're not going to be able to succeed. If we're looking at it and we're going, okay, we could probably do agencies A, B, and C would probably be all right with that are those places that you'd wanna go. And so it's a conversation, it's not a showstopper. So talk to us if you have any concerns about that. We, we really are here to help you with this. Application process. So for the SFS program, you need to apply by the end of February. Um, students like very specific deadlines. So here's one for you, uh, February 28th at 11.59 p.m. If you submit it at 12.01 uh, a.m. on March 1st, uh, will we throw it out? Eh, probably not, but 11.59 p.m. on February 28th. Um, please shoot for that deadline. So there's a form online that you'll fill out some basic information. You upload your resume or CV. We ask for a written statement describing your interests. Why is this something that you would want to do? We want uh, a list of references. Ideally, some of those would be CS faculty, if we can. Um, that, that's helpful. Uh, a hard copy of any non-WPI academic transcripts. For many of you, the only transcripts that you're going to have are going to be WPI-based ones. Um, we do ask for authorization to pull your judicial records and to be able to, to get your unofficial transcript. If you give all, us all of that, then we can pull that from Workday. Um, and you're additionally asked to fill out a form acknowledging that if you accept these scholarships, you will be entering an agreement with the, the federal government with the service obligation. So when you're filling out that acknowledgement form, you're basically saying someday down the road, if I am selected, I will be agreeing to this. And I'm well aware of this now. You would not be signing an official agreement until like August. So you have plenty of time to think about it, but we do ask for people to say, yes, no, I understand what the, the details are here. More information about the scholarship programs are available at the, the link below. For the SciSP program, 
This is again, one where WPI partners with you in completing your application. That means that they're due earlier. So February 1st is the deadline for DOD. They need you to fill out the part online. Um, you also have to email some files to the review committee at WPI so that we can evaluate your application and write um, a statement of support um, if, if we're able to support you. Um, you don't upload a resume with that approach. Instead, they're asking you a detailed application form, which will cover basically the same material. You will upload a transcript. It can be the unofficial one from Workday. You do need two letters of recommendation, one of which must be from a WPI professor. And there are additional instructions at the, the URL below. So we're now getting to the, the questions part of this. So some frequently asked questions. I'll, I'll take care of these um, now, running through the questions and, and doing that. We're gonna have some of the current uh, participants for the, the SFS program share their thoughts with you. And then we're gonna open it up for, for general questions in a moment. So some frequently asked questions that we hear. What if I can't get an SFS eligible job? So if you're picked for the SFS program, you have to do the job search. So you need to be able to get internships over the summers, you need to be able to get full-time employment uh, upon graduation. Um, so students may be, what if nobody wants to hire me? So we've been doing this for a while. Um, so it's been over six years that we've been running the program. 100% um, of our graduates have found eligible employment. 100% of our students doing internships have found eligible internships. Those, those are pretty good numbers, right? You can say, well, what if I, what, I break your record and it's no longer 100% because of me? Like, what happens? Okay, so the, the deal is, if you are unable to get employment within two years of graduation, then the SFS award that you have received will turn into a student loan for the amount that was paid for your studies. So if you think about that, that is the tuition for all the years that you've received scholarship, that is the stipend amounts that you've received, that is books, professional development, all of that. It becomes perhaps a massive student loan. So nobody wants that to happen. You don't want that to happen. WPI doesn't want that to happen. It's actually used as part of our, our review. Each time we go up to renew the SFS program, we get a certain number of students who are unsuccessful, they actually pull our funding. So we want you to succeed and we're, we're gonna be picking people who we're going, yes, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, and by the way, the federal government wants you to succeed. Congress did not make this a student loan program. They made it a program where they wanted people in federal agencies working in cybersecurity. They want you to succeed. So given all of this, we will provide a support infrastructure to you so that we can help you succeed. And again, if you're finding after graduating, um, it's taken you know, six months after graduation and you've still not found options, we're gonna be working with you, trying to help you find different employers. We're gonna be looking at, okay, well, what about state or local government? What about FFRDCs? What about other options? Um, so we'll be helping you with that. But again, it's not, I have to have a job immediately upon graduation, you have this two year buffer. Um, so what happens if I decide not to, to serve the government after accepting the scholarship? Same thing as before, uh, everything that you've done will turn into a student loan um, and you will need to repay it. As part of signing the obligation, you're acknowledging that that will happen. So that, that is part of how this works. Again, we don't want that to happen. If you are finding yourself not certain if you would honor your obligation after receiving one of these scholarship programs, you should probably talk to us about it and we can help you work through your concerns, find out if the program is right for you. Nobody wants you to end up with a big student loan as part of this. Um, do you have to be in the CS department in order to get these programs? No. So you do need to be able to have cybersecurity backgrounds. If you get a cybersecurity background in the ECD, ECE department, that's cool. Are you doing data science and you are also working on cybersecurity as part of that, that's cool. Are you in the math program and you're studying cryptography and the, the finite fields and all of that fun stuff? Sure. Did you know that the biggest employer nationally for PhDs in mathematics is actually the NSA? Who knew? The NSA did. 
Um, so yes, there are opportunities in these other programs in order to be able to succeed and do cybersecurity. So as part of the, the process, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're getting that right kind of education. Um, certainly if you're in the CS department and you're doing the cybersecurity concentration, that's a really good start. If you're in the master's program doing a specialization in cybersecurity, great. If you're doing the master's of science in cybersecurity, we have one of those by the way, um, then that, that qualifies too. But if you're in another program, we'll work with you to make sure that you're getting enough cybersecurity expertise in order to be hired upon uh, graduation. And the last question is, are you required to do a graduate degree as part of either of these programs? The answer is no. Historically, it actually was yes. As part of SFS, you had to get a, a master's degree. Um, now you can just do your junior and senior year of undergrad um, through both programs and that's perfectly fine. So that's it on the, the frequently asked questions. That's pretty much it on the, the materials that I have for you. So at this point, we can switch to having our students that are, are joining us that are in the SFS program already, kind of sharing their experience. Um, so Beckley, um, would you be able to, to go through and uh, call some of our current students? Sure. Uh, so do we have a volunteer, either Avery, Nicole, or Patrick? Um, would anyone like to go first? Um, my idea would be to have you talk maybe about um, what do you feel is the most beneficial thing about being an SFS recipient? That's one idea, but if, if you wanna share anything else, feel free. I can Patrick. get things started. Um, so hi everyone, um, my name is Patrick. I'm currently a junior. Um, I got into the program last year. So I've been in for a little while going through the first kind of job search. Uh, so there's a lot of great benefits obviously with like tuition being covered and all that good stuff. But one of, one of the great opportunities in my opinion is going to these kind of meetings with um, different favorable agencies to kind of learn what they do. It's a really nice opportunity to kind of get a sense of like where you wanna go. I know I always had an issue whenever I was kind of applying for the job, I wasn't really, you're never really sure what you're getting yourself into, like what the job actually entails. Uh, we kind of have a saying whether it's kind of, you know, doing the checkbox, like filling out check boxes on a sheet or kind of actually getting that hands-on experience. Um, so we've had talks from like the NSA, uh, CISO, which is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. And they really give you like a good sense of kind of what your role will be there. Um, so yeah, the, that's kind of kind of the big point for me that I really enjoy about the program. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, I'm a senior and I started SFS last year as a junior. Uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Patrick just said, I'd have to say that the best thing uh, or one of the best that comes with SFS is like just the prestige that having the name of an SFS scholar brings with you. Um, people see that and they automatically again, know you're qualified, like Professor Shu said earlier, but they also look for you during like, uh, like applicant processes and stuff like that. Um, over break, I had someone email me three times at two of my different emails because he found me on the SFS scholar like database and he really wanted me to interview with them. So just that whole community of networking that you automatically get and the names and the email addresses of people that you automatically get from being an SFS is probably one of the best parts. Awesome, thank you. How about Avery next? Hi, so I'm a senior. I joined in my junior year um, and I'm one of the math nerds that kind of Professor Shu was just talking about. <laughs> so I ended up kind of in cybersecurity through the cryptanalysis route. Um, so I'd say that kind of one of my favorite things of the SFS is um, again, kind of just a, a reiteration of what they were saying is um, you get that prestige, but also when you go to places, you'll meet other SFS students. And you'll be in other groups of people with other SFS members and CISIP members and people going through these federal scholarships who are all kind of working towards the same mission. And when you're in those situations, in those places, it's a really cool experience because you're all kind of working together towards the same goal. You have kind of, you're from different places. You're from completely different universities, but you all have a very similar experience and you all have that right away, that kind of that intro point of getting along with each other. So I'm a little bit saddened that we didn't get to go to DC for the uh, career fair, 
that was going to be on January 11th, but I would imagine that would happen in the upcoming years for people who are applying now. And so that would be super cool to go to because you get to be in DC where everything is happening with the federal government. You've got the Federal Reserve, you've got just you name it, any of those departments, they all need cybersecurity roles. And you get to be there and chat with people and just figure out whatever you like. So really, I really like this program. So it's really cool. Thanks, Avery. We have two more SFS recipients here. Um, let's hear from Jonathan next. Hi, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm a graduate student. So uh, like Professor Shu was saying, uh, it's pretty flexible with the degrees. Uh, I'm doing the Master's of Science in Computer Science, um, just a general degree. Um, but like you said, I mean, it is good to have like that cybersecurity background. But I think like the general degree uh, accommodates for that because of the amount of electives that you can take. So really for the MS and CS, there's only three required classes, the algorithms uh, class and then the uh, cyber, uh, com computer foundations class and then either a software or uh, system or, or network class. And then after that, you have freedom to choose basically, uh, I think eight, eight other class, uh, seven other classes uh, to complete the degree. Um, and gives you flexibility, except especially since some classes, uh, you know, they might be offered only once, once a semester, once every other year. And then for, for jobs, um, I mean, if anybody wants uh, like a, a guide, like what jobs in cybersecurity, uh, CISA has a workforce uh, development for cybersecurity workforce uh, jobs. They call the NICE uh, roles. And there's around, I think, 52 roles in there from, you know, software development to uh, customer service and technical support to, you know, data administration. So cybersecurity is a pretty big field um, and there's many jobs in there. Um, so, and then I think this program, uh, one of the big benefits compared to, uh, I think like uh, the, the DOD cyber uh, one and also um, the smart scholarship, I can put that one in there too. It's similar to the, uh, the DOD cyber uh, scholarship. Okay. Except in where you have to be uh, sponsored by a DOD facility, uh, but that one is not cybersecurity related. That one's just uh, technology, uh, technology related, or science and math. Um, but I think one of the big benefits with the SFS is you get more of a freedom to choose where you want to go. Um, where the other two scholarships, you're basically kind of uh, beholden to your sponsor, and you have to do the internships there, and you have to ultimately work there uh, to fulfill your service commitment. So I think that's that's one of the bigger benefits for the uh, an, uh, SFS program. Perfect, thank you. Okay, Declan, your thoughts. Um, so for me, I'm a junior. Uh, just started the program back in the fall. I think one of the biggest benefits for me is the encouragement to go for my master's degree. It wasn't something that I had planned on just because of like, you know, sp spending another year at school or whatever. But now that it's covered uh, because of the three years of SFS, I'm looking forward to pursuing that. Um, I've always considered that a really strong background in computer science in general is great for anything cybersecurity related. So uh, looking forward to that. And then additionally, um, just through the virtual career fairs and stuff like that, I've talked to a lot of recruiters and they're, they have a lot of really interesting project opportunities that I probably wouldn't be open to me if I weren't in the program. Um, so there's a lot of exposure to things that you wouldn't otherwise get to work on, which I find very, very interesting and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Um, and then also I, I find myself more involved um, in cyber stuff at WPI as well. So part of the requirement is you do kind of like a cyber outreach thing every semester where you uh, maybe you give a, a talk at a club or something like that, or you um, do, some, do something else about just cyber related on campus basically, or it could be somewhere else, but stuff like that. I've, uh, I've found myself seeking out opportunities like that more um, in my free time. That's about it for me. All right, I love that all of you were able to think of different benefits and give us different perspectives on uh, sort of the, the multifaceted experience of being in the program. So Professor Shu, do you wanna answer some of the questions from the chat and then we'll take uh, more questions? Yeah, I appreciate it. So um, I've tried to answer some of the easier questions in the chat live. Um, so 
One of the questions that I think I'll, I'll need a little bit more time on is uh, Caitlin's question about whether there's a better chance of getting the scholarship if you already have experience in the field. And if, uh, if you don't have experience, is that a disadvantage? So um, that's a really good question. The SFS and the SISP programs are designed to increase the amount of people who are doing cybersecurity. Congress's stated goal is we want more people doing cybersecurity working in the federal government. And because we're Congress, the way we think of this is through money. We'll give you money to do cybersecurity in the federal government. So this is an incentive program where they're hoping that people who hadn't originally thought about cybersecurity now will do so as part of their careers. So the goal is to get more people in cybersecurity. However, we also wanna make sure that when you're doing your cybersecurity applications, that you end up in a job that you would actually enjoy. So part of the review process is going to be seeing is this somebody who knows what security is? Do they have a, a reasonable idea of is it? Have they had some experience with it? Because we really don't want you to get one of these scholarships only to find out, actually, I hate everything about cybersecurity and I don't like it at all. And now I have to do this for three years with something you don't want to do. So it does make an application more competitive if we can see this person's been involved in cybersecurity. They've explored the concept a little bit. and they, they think that they're interested in it. So we'll certainly ask questions about that as part of the interview in your statement of interest, being able to highlight, you know, this is not a, a fleeting interest is good. But if it is a fleeting interest, what's so wrong with that? So it may be that you apply this year and we say, you know, we looked at your materials. We think you would benefit by getting more cybersecurity uh, experience. Here are our recommendations on things that you can try doing. Why don't you talk to us again in another year? That's not so bad. So uh, in the worst case, we give you some recommendations about how you can learn a little bit more about it. Um, in, in the best case, I mean, we, we look at it and we say, yeah, you're, you're a perfect fit. Why don't we pursue it now? So um, I look at that as a, a positive thing. Another thing that I'll point out is that um, there is no obligation as being an SFS student or a SISP student to speak highly of SFS or SISP. So everybody you've heard from um, are, are not being paid to promote the program. They're, they're asked to share their views honestly with you. Um, that they're saying positive things is, is perhaps a positive thing about the, the program itself. Um, so uh, another question that I saw, um, are uh, fresh people allowed to apply this year for the scholarship uh, to, to get it in their sophomore year? So the answer is no. Um, so you do need to be a junior when you first start receiving the scholarship. So if you become a junior by credits at some point in time, that is when you could begin. If you're saying, well, that happens midway through the year, I will actually be a sophomore in the fall and I'll become a junior in January. Do I have to wait out an entire year? Go ahead and apply. Uh, we may say, yeah, okay, we can start this in January but you, you have to be a junior before we're allowed to, to give you the funding for it. Um, so, okay, uh, I think that's everything that I've seen in the chat so far. Are there are additional questions that people have that we could answer. Yeah, go for it. I'm curious what the interview process is for the application. Is that, I mean, I imagine that's before we submit our application on the 1st or the 28th, but who do we talk to and what does that look like? Right, so the, the interviews are slightly different for SFS and SISP. Um, for SISP, uh, the Department of Defense has specific things that they want us to ask people about. And so we'll take their information and we'll ask about it. That does happen after you do your initial application though. The same is gonna be true of SFS. It's after you've applied we go through and say, okay, who do we, who do we need to interview for these, these applications? Um, it may be that um, for the SFS program, for example, that more people will apply than we'll be able to interview, uh, in which case we'll still be able to give you feedback saying, based on your application, this is, this is what we've seen in our recommendations. Um, for the SFS interview, we cover all the different aspects of the program wanting to make sure that it's a right fit, that you, you've got some awareness of cybersecurity, that you understand the obligations, that kind of thing. Yeah, so all those interviews will, will happen after you've applied. Thank you. 
Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, Jacob, it looks like you're up. Um, I guess this can go for like the, the seniors or the graduate um, SFS students. I was wondering, because um, Professor Shu told me about um, if your concentration is in cybersecurity, you need to do an MQP based on that concentration. I was wondering if anyone here had experience doing an MQP in cybersecurity. And I'm, I'm just curious really about what, what you guys do, because it sounds really cool. So. I'm absolutely certain there's somebody in the audience who can help you with this, but I'll let them take it. Sure. Hi, so yeah, I'm currently in an MQP with Professor Shu. He's our advisor. Uh, me and my friend Shannon, she's also in the SFS program. Um, I want to say there's two other SFS students that are in MQPs with Professor Shu right now. It might be more or less than that. Um, it really depends. There's some projects. I know Professor Walls has projects that he kind of outlines already, whereas Professor Shu, we came in and he gave us a kind of subject and then we were kind of set off on our own to go and explore. Um, we kind of made our own project, so to speak. So there's two different kinds when you're going for MQPs, whether you want to be told what to do or if you want to be guided to find the thing that you're actually interested in, which I recommend. Um, it's making for a much better project. My project specifically, we're looking at how to make like security concepts through isolated environments. So like having different layers of security, how to make those concepts obvious to, uh, we're calling them standard computer users. So people that aren't in cyber, don't know anything about cybersecurity, but um, there's other groups that are doing more system level things. Um, so with Professor Shu, depending on the year, you kind of get to, again, make your own projects, find what you're interested in. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any more questions or. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Are there questions we can help with? Okay. I'm not hearing any. Um, so I'll stick around for a few more minutes in case anybody has some one-on-one some -on -one questions that we can do. Um, so we can uh, stop the recording. Uh,